Hello everyone, I'm Thibaut from XS Catamarans and I'm today with Bruno. Hello Bruno. Hello Thibaut. And we'll be talking about uh, what items we look at when we talk about performance of a catamaran. What are the elements that uh, we want to uh, study on a catamaran to be able to judge or to assess its, its performance. So maybe Bruno, you, you can just share a little bit what is your role in the XS team. Well, I've been with the XS team from the beginning, uh, working on the, on the design of the new boats. And, uh, and it's been a pleasure for a few years now. It's fantastic. So talking about uh, performance, uh, first question I want to ask you maybe is uh, talking about the hulls, you know, when we talk about uh, well, shape of the hulls and so forth. The first information when we talk about the performance of a boat in general and sailboat, namely, is the, uh, the hull shape. So what can you tell us about the hull shape and how is it important? Well, it really defines what, what the boat will behave in, 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 in terms of speed. And so the first thing we calculate is what we call the hull speed, which is based on a displacement hull, so a hull that will not do any planning or, or, or foiling or anything like this. So let's say a, a heavy a Dundee will be a displacement hull. It will give you, it's a very simple uh, calculation based on the overall hull length in the water. Okay. And, uh, and it gives you an indication of uh, the capacity of the boat to reach whatever speed relates to its length. But then every hull is different. And if, you're, if we look at uh, cruising catamarans, we're talking about semi-displacement hulls, which are hulls that are capable in some conditions to do some little bit of planning which means they reduce a little bit the weight they carry and they surf in some waves. And this will allow them to go above what we call this hull limit, hull speed limit. And of course, if you put foils on a very light boat, you will go, you will go with a different, but on catamarans, you can also play what we call the finesse of the hull, which is basically related to the, to the beam of the boat and is dis, its displacement. And when we talk about, uh, for instance, the XS14, we have a finesse number of 7.75, which means nothing to yeah. anybody else. But it indicates that the boat is actually making less wave making resistance than a boat that would not, that would have a lower finesse number. And if you have a less wave making resistance, you actually go through the water better because there are three uh, things that slow you down is the viscosity, is the pressure and is the wave making. So having a, a, a boat like the XS14 with a high finesse number is actually a good sign of, uh, of good behaving in, in, in speed. So the shape of the hull is one thing, but obviously the weight of the boat, which we call in naval architecture term or in the boating world, the displacement is an important element. This is a very important topic because actually talking about displacement, I know there are different ways to consider or to calculate what is actually the displacement of a boat. So often, Bruno, at a boat show or discussing with clients, I'm asked how we actually calculate the displacement of our boats. And I know there are different methods of calculation which can change the result dramatically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but basically there is a box rule, which is the EEC regulation. And everybody's got to comply with those regulations if you produce and intend to sell your boat in Europe. Okay. And in Europe, boat builders intend to sell worldwide through these certifications. And so there are three levels of calculation of displacement. The first one is what we call the empty boat. And that's the most tricky one, because if you look at the, the EEC regulation, they tell you it's everything that's on the standard boat, okay. but it doesn't include anything that can be removed from the boat. So us at Excess, we consider that when we take a standard boat, the boat out of the factory with no option, that's an empty boat. Some of our competitors play around with, the, with, with, the, with those numbers, removing everything that can be removed, like the sails, like the floors, like uh, the doors, door. uh, anything that can be taken out of the boat, which we think is not really a fair way of comparing things. So we, at Excess, will always look sometimes a little uh, heavier than the competition because of this decision to follow the EEC spirit of the rule. Okay. Then there are two other uh, indications from the EEC regulation, which is the MLC, which is the boat light displacement. It means a boat on the water with a crew, with enough gear and enough uh, stuff on board, like half the water, half the fuel, so that the boat can actually go sailing. And that's what we call a light displacement. 
Then there is what we call the MLDC, which is okay. the third rule of the EC. And that includes everything that you have on your option list given into the boat. So that's a, the most heavy solution of, of displacement that you, your customer can pick from. And of course, when we design the boat, we pick a number in between the MLC and the MLDC so that we have a boat that will actually represent what the people will actually uh, go sailing with. To try and to aim at being as realistic as possible. Yes. And what we do also is we pay attention that between the MLC and the MLDC, the center of gravity of the boat is not moving all around the place because okay. we want the boat to keep balanced whatever is, its loading is. So if I take a brochure of one catamaran against another one and I see that it's the same size, the same type of boat, cruising catamarans, but the weight is dramatically different, I can assume that maybe the calculation of the weight is not based on the same reference. Yes, it, it will be always a good question to a, to a boatyard to ask, what is your displacement preference? Is it MLC, MEC, MLDC? And that's a simple question. Thank you. Okay, so Bruno, talking about the whole shape, you spoke about the whole length and, and the finesse and that aspect, but talking about catamarans, obviously, we're on a wide boat. Uh, so let's talk about the beam. What can you tell us about the beam of a catamaran and how does that impact the performance of the boat? Well, the beam, uh, there are two good and bad sides in every decision you make. Well, beam means comfort, it means room, and it means stability. It also means cost, it also means expenses at the marina, and it also means more structure to carry this wide beam. So it's a, it's a debate between how, want, how comfortable you want to be, how stiff you want to be, and uh, how beamy you want to be in the harbour. Mm -hmm. So you have to pay attention to all those four, five, six details to, to take the right decision for your right boat. And talking about width, if we come back to the hull, not the boat itself, I notice there's a lot of effort that is put on uh, how wide is the hull uh, underneath the waterline and above the waterline. Can you tell us about that? Sure. Well, basically, you, you, you can typically look at three types of shape for a section of a hull. A hull, if you, if you cut the boat in half and you look at one hull, it can be a, a U shape, it can be a round shape, or it can be a V shape. There are good and bad in, in all of these shapes. But if we talk about a cruising cat, one of the criteria will be the capacity to carry weight without changing the performance of the boat. And for that, it's, it's, not, it's not a good decision to be too much in a V shape, because if you have a V shape, the more load, the wider the BWL. Or if you have a U shape, the BWL will not change. And the BWL is very important, the waterline beam at the section of the boat, it means the wave making of the boat. So if you can keep it as narrow as possible, it's better. And to do that, U shapes have proven to be a little more uh, in, in terms of performance. And again, we'll talk about how far we can push these, uh, these uh, researches. So to put in simple terms, if I have a V shape, I have a performing, performing shape. If there's no weight on the boat, as soon as I put a, a bit of weight, then obviously I drag more water, I push more and then the U shape is, is better for that. Yes, and that, that's why if you look at the, 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 the catamarans, when they depart for a transatlantic, uh, a boat that is capable of carrying weight will have better performance in the beginning of the race, and, it, and then the, the V-shaped boats, when they become light again, will start to, uh, to perform. Because less fuel, less water, after three weeks of crossing the Atlantic, yeah, yeah, so you are basically more above the water. So at excess, we get, I guess, that we go for the... U-shape. For the U-shape. Thank you. So, Bruno, a big topic in the cruising catamaran world is uh, the platform length compared to the hull length. I know this is a very important ratio. Can you tell us why? First of all, it's a ratio that anybody can check by himself. You look at uh, the boat on a plan view in any magazine and you can make this ratio. You can calculate this ratio. It's, you take the hull length and it can be in centimeters on, a, on, a, on the paper of a newspaper divided by what you measure as the platform length. If you look at a performing, high performing catamarans like an Outremer or, or a TS, very often, the, the hull length will be twice the platform length. So the ratio will be two. Okay. If you design a boat that is entirely designed for charter purposes, then what you want is to occupy as much space as you can and your hull shape 
hull length divided by the platform length will be the same number, so the number will be one. Us at XS, we don't want to go that far because, of course, when you do that, you need to put GRP from the stern to the bow, even in between the hulls, and that's very heavy. That's heavy. not really uh, good behavior at sea. I mean, we, we prefer to keep the length of the platform as reasonably short as possible. So we have decided to aim for a number with around 1.5, 1.6 max. Uh, and we, when we can stick below 1.5, we're really happy. So have the right balance between a choice of comfort and a choice of performance. Yes, yes, because if you were, if you were going for, for a change of two, uh, then our, our cockpit and our saloon would be too small for cruising purposes. Okay, thank you. Okay, Bruno, so, uh, I mean, I know obviously that at Excess, you and the team, you spent a lot of time studying uh, the shape holes, but also the shape of the keels. And there has been a lot of research put into that. So can you tell us a little bit about your results? Yeah, well, first of all, we've been, the only good side of the lockdown for us, was we had a lot of time to do some CFD trials, which is tongue testing virtually the boats. So we designed several different hull shapes, several different uh, keel shapes, and we tested them one compared to the other. The idea was to look at what was the best, uh, regardless of the rest of uh, accommodation, volume, etc. But for given displacement, we found out that uh, playing with the draft of the keels mm -hmm. and reducing the length of the profile was actually providing a lot of gain in performance. We're talking percentage of gain, which is big in your design. Uh, and also looking at the hull shape itself, we, look, we found out, uh, we actually proven, which was not the case until now, until, until we did that, that asymmetrical hulls were more performing than a symmetrical hull. So for the XS14 and the next generation of XS, we've decided to increase the draft on the 14, 240 millimeters more than the generation before, which is a lot. Mm -hmm. And, and we, all, we decided also to go for asymmetrical holes. The combination of both of them is providing almost 10% of gain in terms of drag. So it's a big numbers for, for, for no money spent, really. Okay, and that's quite unique. I mean, in terms of cruising catamaran, these yeah, asymmetrical holes and the shape of our keels, deeper and, and shorter keels, is, is actually a, something quite unique at Texas. Quite unique and, and uh, probably uh, in terms of research on cruising catamarans, it's been decades that we had didn't spend so much time in researching how we could improve the, impro the, the performance of a given displacement hull. Okay. That's a nice job to do. <laughs> okay, so Bruno, we've been talking about uh, hull shapes and the naval architecture and choices in terms of hull shape. One last thing I want to ask you, uh, sometimes I hear you guys talking about prismatic coefficient. Mm -hmm. What does that mean and how does that impact the performance of a catamaran? Okay, the prismatic coefficient, it, it, it's basically a co complicated calculation to tell you how is the volume spread along the hull. So if you have a, a, a low prismatic coefficient, it means you have a big center uh, beam Okay. which is deep and wide and very thin entrance and very thin exits of hull lines, okay. which makes sense on a slow boat and, and which for a long time was considered as a good performing catamaran. But when we did all these tank tests and all we did all these new researches, we found out that in, you know, on the contrary, having a high prismatic coefficient meant volume fore and aft alongside the boat. And this has a very important impact. It damps the pitching moment of the boat. It stops the boat, the boat from going up and down, up and down, going upwind. It really helps you keeping the performance of the boat all the time. And that's why we've come up to a prismatic above 05, 05, 550 uh, as being the new reference for cruising cat and the excess were the first and I hope uh, they will continue to be ahead with, uh, with higher prismatic on the competition, giving uh, uh, on the contrary of what people were expecting 15 years or 20 years ago, a much more performing uh, hull. Okay, so more recent catamarans compared with the older generation and previous generation and certainly before before basically we launched our XS, had hull shapes which were totally different and we've actually discovered something yes. new. We, we actually proven that it was actually the good decision to go with high prismatics. 
Okay. Thank you very much, Bruno. Welcome, Thibault. Thank you for following us. See you Thank next you. time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.